All right. Mm -hmm. Well, greetings, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, fifth and final session of 3IE's Virtual Evidence Weeks, which we've been holding throughout uh, the month of May. We have over 800 people registered to join today, and I see that many are joining and uh, the numbers are rising. Previous sessions in this se series have talked about, uh, first, the opportunities and challenges and strategies uh, for evidence production and use in this new world we are in because of the COVID pandemic. And second, how an online evidence portal that 3IE has created can help policymakers, funders, and uh, researchers to find and use good evidence to improve decision making. The third and fourth sessions uh, concentrated on the need for more attention to costs in evaluation work and to the problem that many evaluations have looked mostly at only the benefits side of the story or effectiveness side, but decision makers really need to know also how much things cost. Today, in this last session in this series, we're focusing on scaling up. Our starting point is the fact that a lot of evidence used by decision makers in governments and, or at funders or elsewhere comes from testing out something at a small scale that is meant to be extended to a much larger scale if successful. And our panelists will help us look at whether we are uh, doing the right things during that early phase or pilot stage to make sure that what is learned there uh, is uh, complete and correct for understanding what might happen if and when the transition is made to a larger scale. It has been famously remarked that uh, the world is littered with thousands of pilot projects that died without ever scaling up. Graveyards of good intentions. That's a huge waste of resources. Is it possible to do better? And if so, how? To introduce myself, I am David DeFerranti, a member of the senior team at 3IE, and I'll be the chair today. Thank you to the uh, audience uh, for joining today. Some of you have participated in several or all of the previous four sessions. You have busy lives, you contribute in many ways, so thank you for sharing your time with us. Uh, and we are curious about where you're joining from and if our technical wizards can post the poll question now It should be on your screen if you can just click on the box that's right for you uh, all of the audience uh, will uh, in a few seconds give you a few seconds to do that and then we'll uh, show uh, uh, the, the results right right away uh, Why don't you show the results now if you can here we are. So we've got uh, uh, all over the world. Bit tough for East Asia given the time. So we a special uh, statue. We'll build a special statue to the to the participants from uh, East Asia and Pacific, but uh, uh, healthy numbers from other parts of of the world. So thank you all for for joining. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. This event is being streamed live on YouTube in case that is better for you than Zoom. It is being recorded. A video recording will be posted on the 3IE website after the session. We are looking forward to your questions uh, from the audience for the panelists to send in questions. First, if you're in Zoom, enter them through the Q&A box not through the chat function, use that instead if you need tech support or to reach the host. Again, use in Zoom, use the Q&A box for questions for the panel and the chat function only for technical support. And if you're joining instead through YouTube, you can leave your questions in the comment box there. Please keep your questions short and to the point so we'll be able to get to as many as possible. Given the large number of participants today, we apologize in advance that it won't be possible to get to all of the questions. If you'd like to follow up online afterwards, please send us an email and we'll do our best to respond. Also, with so many people on the call, it is not possible for the audience to be seen and heard, which we will very much miss, uh, but do send in your, your questions. If the event is disrupted for any reason, such as a major technical fault, or a hacking attack, we'll shut down the session immediately 
and contact you by email about the next steps. If I am somehow cut off due to a technology problem, one of our panelists is ready to take over uh, as in the chair role uh, right away. And for panelists, if I raise uh, uh, my hand like that, uh, please come to a stopping point soon and save your other thoughts for when I come back to you later. Uh, we have a large panel and everyone on it is very thoughtful and has great things to discuss, but sadly our time will be tight today. If I raise two hands, um, please uh, end even more quickly. And if I raise three hands, you should be worried about how I'm able to do that. We urge the audience to stay on to the end because uh, we have more poll questions and wrapping up remarks that we hope you'll find uh, interesting. Uh, for those who are not familiar uh, uh, with 3IE, we support the generation and effective use of high quality evidence to inform decision making and improve the lives of people living in poverty in low and middle income countries. We provide guidance and support to produce, synthesize, and quality assure evidence on what works, for whom, why, how, and at what cost. Our online evidence portal I mentioned earlier brings together extension, extensive information on literally thousands of impact evaluations plus systematic reviews and evidence gap maps. Uh, and it is all freely available to anyone uh, and everyone. Uh, we believe that uh, now more than ever, we at 3IE, uh, now more than ever in this time of the pandemic, decision makers need actionable evidence. Actionable because it is timely, reliable, so good quality, methodologically appropriate, context relevant, implementable, costed, and that was the topic of the last two sessions, and scalable, our topic today. This session will be 90 minutes total. We'll use an informal uh, interview style rather than long presentations. And we'll start to, uh, uh, with questions to the panelists about, and this is an, an overview uh, roadmap to the talk today, or to the panel today. What do we mean by scaling? Why should we bother about it? How does scaling need to be taken into account when evaluations are being designed and carried out? Uh, what do uh, decision makers in government and in non-governmental institutions need and want with respect to scaling? What about funders from the big development agencies to foundations? How does uh, uh, scaling factor into their actions and, and thinking? Uh, what can researchers contribute? And uh, what are we learning about the ch challenges of scaling and, and much more? And then we'll take questions from the audience. Remember, uh, use the Q&A box if you're in Zoom uh, or the comments box if you're in, in YouTube. Uh, and by the way, uh, you may see the background. It looks like I'm in San Francisco. Um, I wish I were. I'm not. I'm just in plain old Washington, DC. Um, now I'm briefly introduced to the panelists and we'll get underway quite quickly soon. Uh, Johannes Lin has been leading work on scaling since he was a very senior, uh, at a very senior level in the World Bank. He is affiliated now with many organizations, including the Brookings Institution, R4D, and the Emerging Markets Forum. Uh, Rachel Turner, uh, who unfortunately, because of a, um, is with us, and that's wonderful, but um, uh, nothing ever goes perfectly in this technological world, and we haven't yet sorted out how to bring her uh, in, uh, in video. She's on and will join, and uh, we apologize, Rachel, for whatever the te technology gods have done to us and you today. Rachel is at DFID, the UK age aid agency, where she has held many important positions and is currently the D director of economic development there, a very senior level post. Uh, Ruth Levine is the incoming CEO of ID Insight and is the chair of 3IE's board. She has headed up the global development uh, program of the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and held important positions at USID and the Center for Global Development. Uh, Mushfiq Mubarak uh, is a professor of economics at Yale University and the founder and faculty director of the Yale <coughs> Research Initiative and innovation, on Innovation and Scale, Why Rise. He has written and published extensively 
And Badisha Barua is a senior evaluation specialist at 3IE, where she leads programs invol involving evaluations and other evidence work, including most recently on uh, rural livelihoods and women's empowerment in, 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 in India and Bangladesh. So let's, t let's have a, a second poll question now, uh, if, if the, here it is. Um, uh, and this is uh, so our panelists can have a sense of what you, our audience thinks about scaling now at the outset of a session. Uh, are scaling issues being adequately considered now uh, during the, the pre-scaling pre stages of evaluations and program implementation? And uh, so I hope everyone is entering now, and uh, we've given a few seconds for, for that. Uh, so perhaps you can show the uh, results now, please. Uh, here it is. Uh, so uh, interesting, interesting uh, results. Um, we uh, think that uh, rarely is, uh, uh, or sometimes is where most people lie is what they've said and uh, um, not very much at most of the time or always. So panelists and audience, that's interesting uh, uh, food for thought as we get into uh, uh, the discussion. So Johannes, let's start with you getting underway, jumping in. Um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna give go you, ahead. I'm gonna give you several questions and ask you to talk for three to five minutes about some of them you pick and we'll come back to you later to talk about any points uh, you don't have time to get to in this first round of the panel. And other panelists will have the same pattern for you as we do this first round. So, Johannes, what do we mean by scaling? And why should we worry about it? Won't scaling happen naturally on its own? For example, markets as markets respond to demand for goods? And how do we fit scaling into evaluation practice? Uh, and why do decision makers in government and non-governmental institutions, institutions need and want? What do they need and want with respect to scaling? Johannes, you have been one of those decision makers at the World Bank and, and there you dealt with many people in very high level positions in governments who were also key decision makers in low and in income, uh, middle income countries. So. Um, Dig into that, Johannes, give us three to five minutes and we'll come back to, to you later for anything you can't cover uh, in this first round. Uh, thank you, David. I hope you can hear me, all of you can hear me. I wish everybody a wonderful day and a good evening or a good night if you're in those parts of the world. Uh, thank you, David, and thank you 3IE for letting me join you today. I think this is a very exciting uh, event and I'm very happy to be part of it. So you asked me a bunch of questions and I'll go down the list uh, but probably won't uh, finish it uh, because I think uh, there is uh, too much to be said and the limit of time is to be respected. So let's start with what do we mean by scaling. Uh, I think it's really important to realize that scaling is about achieving desired and appropriate scale of development impact and impact is the watchword here. It's not about scaling the solution or the particular innovation or intervention or even organization. It's about achieving impact at scale. So what that means is that you actually may have to adapt the solution or change the organization to reach the desired impact at scale. And evaluation actually has a very important role to play in ensuring that we learn in a timely manner, not only whether an intervention works, but also whether we need to adapt it to ultimately achieve impact at scale, and what are the conditions that have to be put in place to actually achieve scale. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, the second question you asked is why worry about scaling? What's wrong with our good old project approach? Uh, most projects are time bound and limited in scale and there's actually nothing wrong with that. It's a good way to organize the work we're doing and most of us actually think and approach our professional life in terms of setting up and getting projects done. The key issue from the perspective of scaling is that we need to think beyond the project if we're interested ultimately in a larger scale of impact than what the project itself can achieve. 
And indeed, as David, as you said, too often projects have been pilots. Actually, I like to call them pilots to nowhere. Or they've been like pebbles that are thrown into a pond and whose ripple, ripples really very quickly disappear and leave really very little notable uh, impact behind. So what we need to do is to ask at all stages of the project, at preparation, at implementation, and during evaluation, the question that we have to ask is, what if this project works? How do we make sure that at the end of the project, we have built the platform that allows scaling to take place after the project ends? And that means we have to help ensure that there's a vision of scale beyond the project, and have to put in place the enabling conditions that allow scaling to happen beyond the project. That means the right institutions, the right policies and regulations. Yes, indeed, the right political conditions, financing to meet costs, partnerships, and for certain projects, the environmental conditions have to be right or the constraints have to be considered to ensure that projects in fact scale. Now, it's important to note that during the course of scaling or during the course of the scaling up pathway the nature and the incidence of the enabling conditions may change and actually your vision of scale may change because as you realize that something works and is scalable you may actually get more ambitious now turning to the third question david won't scaling happen naturally as markets respond ideally yes the private competitive markets will respond to demand if an innovation provides clear benefits and so support the scaling up process of commercial innovators. But for public, publicly provided goods and services, we have to put in place a deliberate scaling pathway and strategies uh, so because market forces do not apply. But even in private uh, business, there may be constraints due to policies and regulations or due to monopolies or inadequate consideration of positive or negative externalities which actually make it important that we think about enabling conditions so the right and appropriate scale is being reached even by private initiative and david this brings me to the last question uh, not your last question but the last question i think i'll answer now and this is how does it evaluation fit uh, into the scaling process from my perspective it's absolutely essential that we evaluate not only the impact of an innovation or of a project which is our condition uh, traditional approach including through rcts but we also need to evaluate whether the design implementation and monitoring of a project or intervention has identified the vision of scale a pathway of scaling presumptive pathway of scaling and whether it is actually addressing the enabling conditions which would allow scaling beyond the project to take place. Finally, I think evaluation should actually, ever so often at least, for particular institutions, assess whether the institution has a systematic focus on scaling and is adequately implementing a scaling strategy for its uh, what it does. And I'm happy to report that one organization, at least I'm familiar with, EFAT, has carried out such an evaluation through its independent uh, independent Evaluation Office and IDRC, the Canadian Public Research Development Research Organization, actually is car currently carrying out such an evaluation. Let me stop here, David, and maybe come back to your last question, which has to do with the decision makers and what do they expect and how we can help them later. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Johannes. Lots there that I hope we'll have time to come uh, back to. Uh, but with an eye on the clock, we'll keep rolling. Rachel. Uh, as with Johannes, I'm going to give you several questions and pick three, uh, some of them, please, or parts of them, whatever you want uh, to cover in three to five minutes, and we'll come back for more later. The first is, uh, as DFID makes decisions about uh, where to put its money, how important is it uh, to have uh, good evidence on what will happen when uh, programs are scaled up from large to small to large? Um, so uh, give us an insight in, in how the thinking is done and uh, is it uh, to, to help choose how much to spread or concentrate uh, DFID support? Uh, DFID here is an example of a major funder, uh, 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 spread or con concentrate across sectors, across themes, across countries. 
it, are you are you concerned and think about managing risks that some of your funding will not have as much impact uh, as uh, if it's more optimally used? And it, are you thinking about uh, creating the right incentives for different staff around the world as they pick what to invest in? So there's a bunch of questions around how DFID uh, makes its decisions. Uh, a second uh, question is, um, uh, will the COVID pandemic change anything about how uh, you all think and act with respect to scaling up and the importance of evaluations for providing evidence for informing your choices? And third, uh, uh, have we learned anything recently uh, about what we uh, were not getting right before about scaling questions and the evidence needed. Something that uh, maybe the pandemic has revealed to us about how our earlier thinking maybe was not completely up to the mark. So Rachel, feel free to pick any parts of those that you like. Thanks very much, David, and thank you for inviting me and apologies, I'm a, I'm a voice uh, uh, and, not, and not a picture. Listen, I did think uh, when I looked at this topic about scaling up in the context of COVID, that it seemed quite a strange thing to be talking about when actually at the moment, developing countries are faced with uh, extreme shocks to their overall economic and fiscal resources. And the key issue in front of our partners, but also ourselves as development agencies, it's one of rationing and it's one of choice and it's about which program to downscale and for governments it's about what not to do and what not to scale up and I did think, well isn't this slightly strange to be talking about scaling up in this environment, but actually I think the issues are the same side of the coin and as we think about the challenges of rationing resources and making hard choices in the context of COVID, uh, we have even more imperative to know the value for money, the unit costs, the delivery impact of the systems that are there. And so that when we are making those hard choices, we're making them well informed uh, and we're making the right choices. So I do think that COVID uh, is really actually meaning we're having to really, really drill down. And, uh, and in a crisis like this, when every pound, every you know, shilling, uh, every cent counts, then actually the imperative to really understand the evidence and the value for money that we're getting from interventions it's almost second to none, I would say. And of course, we're trying to do that in an environment where, um, you know, the evidence is, is quite, um, you know, it's, it's very real time and, and, a, and a lot of it is untested. I think the thing we've learned is about the balance between things that have been scaled and the things that can be scaled with COVID. So I think we're learning a lot that what we need uh, in COVID is shock responsive social protection systems. And so what we need are government services and targeting systems that have the ability to be scaled very, very quickly and very, very effectively. And so I, I think that's a, the, there's an issue about scale there. Um, which is not standing capacity scale, but flexible and responsive scalability. And we've seen some really innovative um, systems coming out of our partners, where systems that were designed, for example, for the rural poor, are being very, very quickly flexed and scaled to tackle the newly urban poor in ways that, uh, you know, uh, we would never have imagined that decisions like this and systems could be set up within weeks. And so I think, you know, what we're going to have to do is to, is to learn the lessons from that when we begin to think about scale and build flexibility into scale. So, so it's a really interesting and really difficult time. But I think um, the imperative on being able to put support in to the places where it's most needed in COVID to have the maximum effect possible uh, is actually kind of re-energizing this whole debate about scale actually, David. And I think 
you know, I hope that when we come through this crisis, we're actually going to have a, a, a lot of new evidence um, that we'll be able to kind of, I think, take a breath and pause and learn from. Um, maybe I've taken up most of my time and I'll come back to your other questions next time, David. Great, thank you, uh, Rachel. And uh, many good things for us to come, come back to there. Um, what we're learning now about speed and things that can happen more quickly. It'd be nice to hear more about uh, the examples uh, where you've seen that and uh, how we'll learn the lessons, lessons and how this period is re-energizing the debate. But let's uh, hold that and uh, Ruth, uh, for your questions, again, pick and choose. Uh, first, thinking about your role at the Hewlett Foundation, and for that matter, you've had many roles in many organizations, so pick from any of them, and, uh, and, uh, and how uh, uh, philanthropy and other funders, from your perspective, uh, think about uh, supporting scaling up. Uh, when a foundation, or any funder, funds a pilot, how do you think it should help create the enabling conditions for future scale up? Uh, and uh, uh, discussions about scaling often focus on scaling of projects or programs. Is that all we should be talking about, or is there something about the scaling of ideas that is also uh, important? So over to you, Ruth. Thank you very much. It's great to be part of this, uh, this event uh, and to be with people who I'm learning a lot from already um, today and have learned much from in the past. So David, you asked a lot of questions and I think you're particularly interested in me kind of putting back on the hat that I wore when I was director of the Global Development and Population Program at the Hewlett Foundation. Um, so I'll speak mostly from that experience, I guess. Um, so, you know, all funders are all very different in the way they, they think about it. Uh, they think about, um, how, but, but I think they're similar in, in one regard in, uh, in general terms, which is that all funders recognize that they themselves do not have sufficient resources to really solve any consequential problems by themselves. And so what they look for is to identify ways that they can spend their money, they can dedicate their resources that will have disproportionate impacts. It's really the main rationale for uh, investing in research. The idea that you're going to put money into a one defined research uh, project, one defined study, the findings will benefit many others and alter behavior over time. So, you know, I think the way many funders think about scale is that they will invest in sort of a particular project, a particular intervention to the point where it's um, kind of refined and tested. And if it shows that it has a positive uh, and, and uh, important impact, that they will then you know, advocate for others to take it on and um, put much more, um, many more resources in to get it to um, a larger number of uh, people, larger number of communities. Um, I think that uh, often foundations and other funders have been attracted to the idea that they can, they can put um, resources into work of organizations that they find it easy to work with. And those are often international NGOs. As I say, kind of like refine the, the project, maybe uh, use an impact evaluation to see whether or not there's a net impact. And then uh, um, support work to try to get governments to take it on board, right? To introduce it into their own public systems. I think the track record on that as, as um, kind of a, a nice uh, an image as that is, uh, as beautiful as that looks written in a proposal. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I think the track record on that is pretty poor um, and that we have very few instances where an NGO incubated idea has then been scaled by government. Um, so 
I think one of the things that I learned maybe before working at the Hewlett Foundation was how important it is for the ideas to be incubated within the organizations that are eventually going to um, <clears throat> expand them. Uh, and, <clears throat> and if you're thinking about government, how important it is then to really have deep engagement with government partners from the very beginning. Then how important it is for the research on what the effectiveness is of a particular program or intervention to include not only questions about does it work, but as you've talked about um, in earlier sessions, I think, uh, can we afford it? And very, very importantly, can we implement it? The capacity for implementation is always limited, often much more limited in um, uh, government than, uh, <clears throat> uh, than in some relatively well-resourced uh, international NGOs. And so really making sure that the, the questions about does it work are complemented by can we implement it and can we afford it. Um, uh, and in the case of government implemented uh, programs, is it acceptable, feasible within our political context? Um, let me turn briefly to the question of, um, that you asked, which is quite intriguing, is the, the idea of scale through the spread of ideas. And, um, you know, when I was at the Hewlett Foundation, we uh, invested uh, in significant ways in looking at whether the methods of human-centered design and the insights that can be derived from um, you know, fairly uh, deep ethnographic work uh, can inform the design of services. And in that case, we were looking at family planning services, particularly for adolescent women. And uh, so in that case, the, the what, what we were looking at as, as possible, as something to, that we could um, support the scale of, was not so much a particular intervention, but the idea that services should um, be designed based on a deep understanding of and responsiveness to clients. And uh, I, I think that that's an, also a different way to think about uh, scale and requires really understanding what in the in the field you're talking about, in that case in family planning, what is the kind of evidence, what is the kind of, in some cases, storytelling that can move uh, others to adopt new ideas. Great, thanks Ruth. And uh, many things we'll want to uh, come back to. Uh, and uh, the questions are already flowing in great numbers. The good questions from the audience, keep them coming in. Uh, which we will um, come back to. And there are questions for those who've spoken and for the entire panel, uh, digging into uh, much of what uh, has been said. And uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, Ruth, uh, the points that you've been making about deep engagement and can we afford, can we implement, is it feasible? Uh, th these are things that seem to be resonating with our, with our audience. So coming back to that, but first, uh, Mushfiq. Your questions, um, what can research contr contribute to the debate about scaling and about evaluation for work for building good uh, evidence uh, on scaling operations? Questions. You've been also second, you've been doing a lot of work on the pandemic uh, and how to respond. And uh, what is coming up in that work that is relevant for efforts on scaling and evaluation uh, and evidence generation? Is the pandemic and the response to us to it teaching us something about scaling and the reverse is what we know about scaling helpful for learning how to deal with the pandemic. Uh, for example, uh, social protection programs like uh, cash transfers uh, to people out of work uh, who need to move money fast, a point that uh, Rachel uh, emphasized or talked about in her remarks. 
they need to go to those kinds of uh, uh, interventions need to go to scale quickly. What is coming up that uh, in, in, in your um, work, uh, Mushfiq, that is relevant uh, for our discussion here? Hi, uh, thank you, David. Um, so if I may, um, I might, I, I, I'd like to share my screen in order to just uh, focus people's attention on, uh, on some visuals uh, while, I'm, while I'm speaking. And, um, and each is probably worth an hour long conversation. And so I'm going to maybe try and uh, address just the first one and not the second one and hope to leave some time uh, in the second round of our interaction for the, for the COVID response. Because yeah, as, as soon as Rachel started talking about social benefit transfers, immediately I, I was thinking about you know, the scaling the work that we're doing right now. And we're learning a lot. I mean, in fact, I think in the last six weeks, I've learned more than any other uh, six week period of my life. So uh, what I'd like to talk to you about is about research. And as I was, you know, academic and we are skeptical by, by our nature, right? I'm going to throw up even more questions, complexities of, around the issues of scaling um, in, in terms of, you know, that this is not just a question of like finding a program that works and then figuring out, okay, how do we now institutionalize this in, in, some, in, in, in some government process, okay? So we are trying to add wireize the Yale Research Initiative on Innovation Scale. This is a network of uh, researchers from around the world. We are trying to develop this, this science and uh, tackle these complexities. So let me tell, uh, you know, tell you a little bit about what these complexities might be, right? So imagine that you start with a program that looks promising, right? You do the pilot scale trial, right? It looks promising in the sense of the data suggesting that this is improving people's lives in some way, right? And now the question that we have to ask ourselves, the reason why we're doing the evaluation to begin with is if we were to, you know, if we were to sort of scale this up and do this at large scale, would it continue to have that positive effect on people's lives? And there are many reasons for us to pause and think, you know what, the result that we get you know, the answer that we get to that big policy question may not be the same answer that we get at the pilot scale trial, right? And so we need to, you know, grapple with those uh, differences and complexity. There's a disconnect between the research that we do at pilot scale versus the, the policy question that we are trying to answer. So what are those disconnects, right? So one, you know, this uh, uh, circle I have on the left on political economy, it's that often when we're doing pilot scale trials, government don't notice or care, right? But of course, if there's a chance that this becomes policy, then they are gonna notice, they're gonna to react to it. That reaction might be something like, oh, you're providing this service in this area, so we'll redirect our resources elsewhere. Or it could be the exact opposite, that you're providing some skills training here, uh, so we'll take advantage of that um, you know, enhanced human capital and use our industrial policy or trade policy to build factories here to take advantage of the skilled workers, right? Either way, at scale, the effect of the program will just look different than the one you get at a pilot scale trial, right? And it could be even more complex. Sometimes we have noticed in our programs that you run something, it is on a large enough scale, then politicians respond to it because they notice that voters like the program, right? They try to associate themselves with the program. And when that happens, if we are messing up the information environment for voters, like it becomes harder for them to distinguish between say good politicians versus uh, 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 bad or, or politicians that try, just try to take advantage of a situation, then we may actually undermine political accountability and that might be the fundamental cause of the underdevelopment that we're, we're trying to address, right? So that's just one box, okay? So there's, I, I won't go, I won't have time to go through all these boxes, but just another one would be spillover effects. So sometimes, you know, programs at small scale, you know, you're focused on the beneficiaries, the direct beneficiaries of the program, but of course, as you scale things up, um, as you, as you scale things up, then other people start getting affected. Other people learn about the program, or it could be that you're sh sharing risk or making transfers to other people in your networks, they get affected. And even at larger scale, markets change, so prices might change. So if you provide skills training, skill wages might fall, right? So initially in a pilot scale trial, you saw that lots of uh, the people who receive the skills earn higher wages. But when you move to the, at, at full scale, what you see is that if everybody gets the same type of skills training, wages fall and uh, people compete with each other and you don't get the exact same, same program. Right? So this is what we call general equilibrium effects and economic problems. Right? Uh, so there are many such complexities uh, to think through and uh, like macroeconomic effects, there's external validity. So how do we 
combine results from, from different places and make a prediction about a new place, right? So we have researchers who are, um, um, uh, who are working on each, each of these areas. Um, so now uh, let me just end with one simple example of how this gets actualized in, in, a, in, in a real world project. So, um, so I've been working for the last 10, 12 years on the topic of seasonal deprivation, right? In agrarian areas, you have these pre-harvest lean periods where a lot of people report missing meals, right? So this is food insecurity that corresponds to the pre-harvest period for the main rice harvest in Bangladesh. Okay? So why, you know, why do people miss meals? Uh, why, why is there the seasonal hunger, right? Could be because of a variety of reasons. You know, they're, they're not able to save enough. They don't, they don't have access to credit markets, right? Or it could be because labor markets are not spatially well integrated. So there are other places where they could be earning money, whereas they, they are stuck in these places where people are just waiting for the crop to grow and there are no jobs. Okay? And so noticing that a lot of these places are within sort of four or five hours away travel to uh, cities that offer jobs. So these agricultural workers who don't have much to eat during that period, they could move to cities and find work in construction sector or rickshaw pulling, et cetera, right? So recognizing that we ran a program, uh, initially of course a pilot scale program, encouraging people by providing travel subsidies, encouraging them to, um, to, uh, to travel to cities that might work during that period. And so what happened was that initially we were just focused on measuring the economic effects of the beneficiaries in our pilot scale. So the initial studies showed that by providing travel subsidies, you can increase migration. And when you increase migration, um, the, uh, people's incomes go up, their consumption goes up, their families end up consuming three meals a day rather than two meals a day. Okay. So that's great. So now there was a question of scaling this program up. But as soon as we thought about scaling the program up, there is two dimensions that we have to think about. So one is that there are a lot of non-economic dimensions of life that of course matter. It's not just about migration income. Uh, so for example, if the income increase comes with family separation, that's of course relevant to people's welfare. And we need, to way, we need a way to understand that. Um, and if migrants leave, they're leaving their families behind, that might lead to unintended consequences on the family and on women. We need to track those. And then similarly, like as we scale the program up, we have to think about how is the rural economy changing as lots of people migrate. And then as you go, as you go on uh, to scale it up even further, you might then start worrying about how is the city economy gonna change when all these migrants start landing in the city at the same time during the lean season, okay? So let me stop there and just say, look, uh, the way we should be thinking about research on scaling is that we cannot declare victory on the basis of just this top left corner. We can't just say, okay, look, we found some promising results, which we did about 10 years ago, right? Now, if you want to responsibly scale this program up, right, you really have to take a much more comprehensive view of not only direct effects, but spillover effects on others, right? Both and think about the markets that these beneficiaries interact with, and also think about unintended consequences of these programs at scale, which may not show up at the pilot scale trial. Thanks, Mushfiq. Um, uh, you already generate a lot of questions from the audience, as also uh, Ruth's remarks that I got a long question. We will be here for the next 90 days, not next 90 minutes. Um, that's good. So audience, keep it flowing. And uh, we'll go to Badisha now to complete the first round. Uh, Badisha, you've been uh, leading some major evaluations for 3IE that get into crucial issues about scaling, including a study where the government has already taken a decision to scale and wants to know how to improve what was tested at a smaller scale. And so what have you been discovering from that work is one question. Secondly, you've also been thinking about the challenges of scaling in situations where there are capacity constraints for implementation. Uh, and uh, maybe those constraints were not adequately looked at during the pilot, but they will be very relevant if scaled up. And uh, you've considered what we have learned from evaluations of programs already at scale. So over to you, Patricia. Uh, we can't hear you. Good. Thank you, David. And uh, thank you all the panelists for their great insights. Uh, in my short career as a relatively short career as an evaluation uh, evaluator here at 3IE, I think I had the uh, good opportunity to be involved in um, you know, a couple of uh, in leading 3IE's work on uh, rural livelihoods 
through um, promotion of financial inclusion and livelihoods in, in the interventions uh, on women's self-help groups. And this was in India. I'm um, currently working with um, Worldfish on a large uh, aquaculture project in Bangladesh. Uh, these are really, these have generated some insights on uh, capacity and scale, which I'd like to share um, today. Well, the first learning that I had uh, was that scaling up in itself is dependent not only on evidence of a pilot program, but also based on, but it's also dependent on the capacity of the scaling up uh, agency, as well as the political uh, will to scale up. In the case of uh, one of the studies that we have been working on, which is the large scale impact evaluation um, of, um, of rural livelihoods in India, uh, the question that was posed to us by the government was, uh, was something that has not been posed to me before. The question was, uh, the questions were actually, what will happen if we don't scale? And now that we have decided to scale, tell us what is the best way to do it. Um, and uh, it was in this context that we realized that impact evaluations are very helpful in, uh, of pilot programs are very helpful because they give a proof of concept of what works and what does not work in an ideal situation. But typically these such impact evaluations do not uh, capture because they focus so much on the outcome side, they don't really focus that much on uh, gathering enough data on the systems that were in place, the inputs that went in um, into the project and, um, and, 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 on, and on costs. So, and it is easier said than done that these data need to be collected. We found that often in retrospect, you know, um, particularly when this is done retrospectively, one sees that the program has been successful and then it is a forensic ex exercise to find out why was, it, uh, why was it successful and what would be needed to scale up. Uh, the thing is, what we have understood is that uh, implementing agencies take implementers actually at different levels take uh, decisions very intuitively and there's often no documentation of why these um, decisions were taken, what drove these decisions. So um, perhaps a small quick solution for, to this is to think about, uh, you know, m and &E systems. Um, m and &E systems that are built up at the, at the pilot uh, stage and specifically built to answer uh, what is needed to take it to scale. Uh, these will include, as has been pointed out by previous panelists, not only, you know, the, you know, we need to know inputs, we need to know the systems that, in, uh, that are in place, and we also need to know what are the impacts. So the impact side is certainly in, uh, uh, important, but the input and the mechanisms and the system side are equally important. And this we have found is where investments are, uh, are, are low, or even if they are high at us at some point are not sustained. Um, and there's really a lot that can be uh, learned from uh, these exercises you know, and what can be done and uh, what can be done effectively. Let me give you a quick um, example from my learning. Um, it is that, um, you know, our experience showed that, uh, you know, taking the program to scale meant that the quality of implementation changed. Um, you know, because the in institutions that were responsible for taking the program to scale were had a different set of capacities than the um, than than the than than when it was done at the pilot stage, and essentially what we have at the scaled up phase is a very different program. It may be similar in concept to what was there in the pilot phase, but actually in reality the critical drivers of change have changed, have, have differed between pilot and uh, scale. So we don't know if whatever we are seeing at the scaled up phase is attributed to, attributable to the change in the mechanism or is it just a good idea that got translated. Um, uh, to, in response to your second question on capacity, uh, this, is, this has been a challenge throughout that we have uh, tried to examine the best we can. The challenge typically comes when uh, the implementing the, the agency that's doing the pilot is different from the agency that is doing the scale up mm -hmm. and capacities. So um, 
it is important to maintain that a steady, you know, a sustainable level of capacity between the pilot phase and the you know, scaled up phase. And there are ways of doing it. NGOs typically second, uh, you know, their staff to the government if the, if the government has taken the, the, taking the program to scale. But perhaps then the question that is relevant is when do we withdraw the, stuff, uh, the support? When is the program completely, when can the program be run completely by the uh, scaled up agency? And then of course, um, you know, there is the, and again, I just wanted to, uh, you know, emphasize the need to get an assessment of the capacity of uh, the scale up, scaling up agency. Uh, I think it's a danger, and I think uh, you know previous panelists have pointed this out, pointed this out that if pilots become very prescript, prescriptive in nature, then they can be very binding, and it's a it's a recipe for failure. Thing. So certain amount of um, uh, customization at the local level and tweaks are necessary, certainly. But as an evaluator, the question that will come to me is: Are the two programs even similar? Um, I think these are thoughts that I would like to uh, leave uh, you know, open to other panelists and also for the audience to think about. And uh, yeah, and maybe we'll take the next questions in the next round. Great, thank you, Patricia. And, and uh, really uh, uh, terrific uh, reminders to us all of some of the practical and very critical issues that uh, when you're working close to the ground, you see firsthand. So for example, uh, when you mentioned that uh, if, uh, if the people doing the pilot and doing the scale up are different, uh, there can be problems. That resonates with a lot of what I think Ruth was saying about the degree of engagement uh, and, and making sure that um, uh, we're not in a test tube that's divorced from, from uh, uh, all of the practicalities of, uh, of scaling up. So what we're going to do now is um, in this next round, we're going we're gonna to combine two things. Uh, we're, uh, actually, three. Why not make it more difficult for the uh, panelists? Um, first, panelists, you get a chance to go back to any of the questions asked at the outset uh, that you um, uh, want to say more about and didn't have time to. Uh, uh, second, you may have a comment on what some of the other panelists have said. And uh, do feel free to jump into that. And thirdly, we're going to already start weaving in uh, questions from the audience, which have been rolling in, and they're great questions. So uh, here are some to think about. Uh, Rachel, a question, and this could be for everybody as well. Uh, Rachel, um, people are, are interested in the, in the question, uh, whether you think there are things that we're not getting right in your observation, your experience, we the world, we defend, which, however you want to. Uh, uh, now, as we think about uh, uh, scaling and, and the choices that we have to make uh, in this new, new world. Uh, second, um, uh, the question, and this was uh, to you, Johannes, but it's also for everyone, uh, uh, about the questions that are asking, they'd like to hear more about what it is that um, needs to be done during the uh, the pilot or the evaluation phase uh, to ensure that uh, uh, we don't have an incomplete or incorrect view of what uh, the issues will be uh, in during the scale up phase. Some of that has come out already from Ruth's and Patricia's and, and also uh, Mushfi's remarks. Uh, there's interest in hearing more and also interest in hearing Johannes and all, everyone. Uh, more about what what do decision makers want and need. Uh, there's another question. Uh, when to scale? That's for anybody and everybody. Um, and there's a question. Uh, we have been uh, working on the valuation, including evaluation for the purposes of scaling, for a long time. Why why is not more of it being done well? Why are we having this discussion? Why are we concerned? that uh, uh, the scaling dimension is, is not being adequately uh, woven into the work that's done at earlier stages. That's a, that's a, a, a big question. And finally, for, for the moment, um, there's a, a great interest in hearing more examples uh, of successful scaling up. Uh, so Rachel, you, you talked a little bit about uh, one or, or uh, rural and urban and how things could be done more quickly than we had realized before. 
and uh, and uh, Mushfiq, you're you gave a, a very good example. So I think there's interest from the from the audience in in that. So let's uh, let's do another round, uh, starting um, Johannes with you. Thanks, thanks, David, and thanks uh, everybody, uh, especially the panelists, but also great questions. Uh, let me maybe start with the last one because one of my favorite examples of uh, successful scaling up is the. A conditional cash transfer program Progresa Oportunidades in, in Mexico. And as it happens, we actually have a terrific uh, sort of analysis and, and overview of how it was uh, scaled up and uh, how evaluation was used as, as an integral part of uh, the scaling up process to inform scaling up. Uh, this was Santiago Leffi's book on the experience of uh, Progresa Oportunidades, which he published, albeit 14 years ago but it's still in my view is a classic and anybody interested in, uh, in scaling up, especially actually also now with uh, so much focus on social, uh, on the social programs in support of COVID, I think is worth going back to. So I would highly recommend this, but there are of course plenty of other examples, whether it's BRAC or, or other such uh, successful programs that uh, have been studied and, and can be studied. I should also briefly mention that uh, when, I, when I earlier indicated that some organizations use the scaling up lens uh, in terms of assessing their own performance. Uh, actually, uh, the Green Climate Fund, I see Joe Puri is on board, I think, today in this event. Uh, the Green Climate Fund actually, in its uh, assessment of uh, the Green Climate Fund performance, the Independent Evaluation Office, I think, is doing an excellent job and could well serve as a kind of an example that uh, others might want to follow. More generally, uh, one of my big concerns is that most of independent evaluation organizations in the uh, aid uh, agencies actually don't yet adequately focus on uh, on scaling up. What they tend to do is they tend to take the uh, original design objectives of the, of the project as given and then evaluate whether or not the project achieved the design objective. But if the objective inappropriately did not consider scaling up as, a, as part of the objective, then you actually not entitled or able to evaluate whether or not uh, a, a, a program or an institution for that matter adequately pursues scaling up. So I think the evaluation community, in my view, actually has a lot of work to do in adequately bringing in uh, the, the scaling up perspective. And what we heard from all the other panelists today actually reinforces my perspective uh, that we really have to be focused, yes, on impact, obviously, but also on what I'd call the enabling conditions. And we heard a lot from the other panelists on particular aspects of enabling conditions, whether it's political, the political constraints, potential political constraints, whether it's capacity constraints, whether it's costs, uh, financing, and so on. Uh, so I, I feel there's, there's a lot of work to be done for the evaluation community. And uh, I, I wish you guys well. Now, in terms of COVID, uh, let me just reinforce the point that David made. I think uh, here we have an opportunity to apply some of our lessons from, from scaling, and also we have a, an opportunity to learn from the scaling experience uh, in, in this particular case uh, of the crisis. Because obviously, and I agree with, I think it was Rachel who said that, uh, you know, uh, in some cases we have to scale down. Yes, but at the same time, this crisis is about a crisis scale. It's a global scale, it's a national scale, it's at, uh, at, at, uh, at local and, and provincial scales. It is a scale, a crisis at scale. And so figuring out how we reach scale impacts and do it quickly with urgency is indeed very, very important. Uh, what we've seen, and we've done a review of initial experience, uh, what we've seen is partnership and coordination are obviously critical. Technology and IT have a now a major opportunity to prove themselves. Cross-sectoral interactions, uh, for example, that you have extension agents, rural extension agents, agricultural extension agents, actually also providing COVID-related health and, and uh, such information, or for that matter, educators, teachers providing uh, such, uh, such inputs uh, are, are important. So cross-sectoral uh, uh, cooperation and finally, the institutional responses. Uh, you'll see that a lot of your 
aid organizations, if you come from uh, private or public uh, organizations, actually are simplifying processes. And I've learned that earlier in the World Bank career. When there's a crisis, we can actually fun function extremely quickly and, and effectively in some ways better than actually with our usual uh, somewhat more bureaucratic processes. The trouble is as soon as the crisis is over, we go back to business as usual. And we have not learned the lesson that simpler processes, quick action and quick reaction are actually the way to do the business. And so I hope this time around, the institutions can actually learn from that. Thank you, over. Great. And just before we go on, uh, Rachel, to you, uh, let's do another poll question. Um, so uh, if the uh, technical wizards who control this could put up the next question, and it is this, um, is the evidence used by decision makers misleading be now because it does not adequately reflect issues around scaling? And if so, is this a major or a minor problem? So we're asking all of us, do we think the topic we're talking about is a, uh, a major, minor uh, uh, question? Let's see what uh, we uh, we're finding from the results. Give another sec few seconds for people to click on the answer they think is most uh, reflect reflective of their view. And now let's see the results. Okay, so we, um, in case anybody can't see it, um, uh, the uh, uh, a high percentage think this is a major problem. Um, uh, that's the, the biggest group by far. And then next is uh, just below that, is in between major and minor. Um, minor or not a problem, very underrepresented. Uh, so we, we think we, we are on the topic that's a concern. Unless we get this right, uh, we may be giving decision makers uh, the wrong information uh, to go with. All right, so let's uh, then go on, Rachel, to you. Again, take your pick. Um, questions that were asked before or uh, uh, comments you have on what others have said or uh, some of the questions that I mentioned had come in from the audience thus far. Thank you, David, uh, and great to listen to others and see the questions. You asked me, you know, what are we doing wrong? And actually, I think this goes back to that question about decision makers. I mean, what are we collectively doing wrong? I mean, I think, first of all, it's really important to understand, you know, who are the decision makers about taking programs to scale in developing countries and, and to work that out. And I guess if you're part of a public sector system, as I am in the UK, you understand that these are very, very complicated processes. They're contested, they're competitive. There are spending reviews and spending round where resources are competed for. You know, sometimes there'll be space for evidence, but there won't always be a lot of space for evidence in decisions around taking things to scale. So I think we sometimes, uh, I think in this community, Sort of have a sense that those scaling decisions are all technical ones just you know sitting there waiting for the evidence and they're far more complicated than that and i guess we know that so maybe what we do wrong is a we really need to understand who's taking those decisions and how they're being taken and where the space for evidence and trade-offs is because you know every, every everything has an opportunity cost so mm -hmm. it's always about presenting uh, relative choices and not these are not absolute choices they're relative choices and so I think that's really important I mean I think the other thing that um, taking things to scale uh, I think somebody made the point about the private sector in the Q&A and that, you know and, and I think you know people work very hard to think about how to get the right amount of subsidy to take innovations and to share risk to take private sector development instruments to scale. Uh, and I think often that's done well. I think what people find hard is to then unwind from that and take that subsidy out and use it uh, effectively in the next set of frontier innovations. And so I think we tend to get kind of layer of subsidy on layer of subsidy when we could have let go. And I think the point about the Green Climate Fund is very pertinent. I mean, we see the renewable sector 
reaching quite a lot of commercial maturity and arguably the case for subsidy in a lot of renewables is lessening and there are other places where you might want to put it in you know in batteries or in transmission and distribution but the ability to sort of move the money to the next frontier of scale and not get stuck I think mm. is also something that we we don't do so well I guess going back you asked me at the beginning about um, what does this feel like from the uh, development ministry point of view and we you know we're not an agency in DFID we're a cabinet level line ministry and uh, uh, you know and, and and therefore we have to take our decisions um, thinking very carefully about the uh, geopolitics the set of relationships so you know to the extent that um, we ourselves uh, will be thinking about our role in scaling things we absolutely have to think about the portfolio as a whole about the portfolio risk about the balance and diversification of that um, and so we can't only be driven by scale because only being driven by scale might lead you to very very concentrated portfolios in a mm -hmm. very few sectors in a very few countries mm -hmm. uh, just you know that's just math you know the size of the budget versus the size of the economies so there's a really difficult balancing act but I think the appetite for evidence and the requirement for evidence is definitely there in the UK. I mean, we do pride ourselves on being very rigorous in how we bring evidence into decision making. But nevertheless, there's always a sense of, um, of balance and portfolio uh, and the ability to flex as well. And I think that that goes back to where I started, really, which is there's scaling and descaling. <laughs> And actually mm -hmm. the day-to-day -day decisions are as much about what you stop doing and where you take the money out as they are about what you grow. And I, and I guess that comes back to the kind of, I mean, these are just classic issues of choice, aren't they? But uh, I think it's important that people have that, that framing. Um, so I'm not sure if there were any other Q&A targeted at me, but uh, I think I've covered... Um, mm -hmm covered most of them people are asking about examples of shared of successfully scaled projects mm -hmm. i mean something i always talk about is um i mean johannes will know this but if you look at the the world bank and ida and the refugee window that was created in ida which specifically came out of a conversation that relying only on the humanitarian system to reach refugees was limiting scale. And so I think that was a really interesting conversation that led to an architecture shift about reaching a certain population at scale. Um, and that, that came out of work looking at unit costs of coverage as well. So I think we do see those kind of places where people are really concerned about unit cost and really looking for ways to reach a larger population at a much lower cost per person reached and then we see a big architecture shift and we see cost being driven out so so lots of examples i think in the system thank you thank you rachel and i wish we had more time there's, there's a lot of topics we could go into in more detail there but we do need to move on um ruth over to you Yeah, thanks very much. Wow, what a rich conversation this is. So many issues that um, to unpack. Let me let me take a couple of the points that David you um, provided prompts for. So, one is <clears throat> I'm paraphrasing. Why do we do this so badly now? Um, so you know, I think there are a bunch of constraints that uh, have limited our both our imagination in some ways <laughs> and our um, uh, the effectiveness of our actions. So I'll, I'll point out four of them. So one is, and again, now I'm wearing temporarily a funder hat. Um, uh, so one is time frame. You know, I think you know often the funder strategies are relatively short, and that is relative to how long it actually changes. It uh, it requires to introduce change into a system and to have it bear fruit. And so there's an attraction to 
some small scale activity that you can then imagine would be um, would be uh, scaled up by others. Uh, budget, clearly I talked about the importance for funders of uh, finding ways to spend uh, some money, much less than is required to solve a big problem, and then uh, imagining how uh, others might um, provide more resources under the right conditions. Third, um, and I will say uh, maybe present company accepted, uh, there is a problem of siloed expertise, uh, and particularly in the academic community, but not, not limited to that, where um, it's very hard for one researcher, one um, uh, um, uh, person or set of people to bring together all the, the threads that are required to really understand a problem. And, you know, I think we, we've already uh, heard this. So you, you, you may have people who can estimate the net impact of a small scale program very well, but they might not be the right people to provide the full range of decision support regarding the fiscal space for a program, regarding the, the um, general equilibrium effects. And so providing kind of holistic decision support and thinking through all of those different issues, I think, is um, challenged by the way um, expertise is organized uh, in <clears throat> um, and rarely around, um, again, the kind of holistic set of, of uh, questions that a decision maker might need the answer to. And then uh, fourth, I, I think that, um, honestly, I, I think that part of the reason we fail is because we engage too much in some version of magical thinking, thinking that um, ideas imported from outside will take root and will be able to yield these quite significant improvements in, um, in health, in education, in <clears throat> uh, resilience. And we underestimate the complexities, except in retrospect when we can list all of them out uh, as reasons why our dreams didn't come <laughs> true. Um, let me just um, offer very briefly, maybe a little bit of an alternative way to think about this outside of the paradigm of or in contrast to the paradigm of you start small with a finely tuned small scale activity, you figure out whether it works or not, and then you, um, it, you mobilize resources and expand the reach. So let's turn that on its head a little bit and recognize that when politicians come into office, they make big promises. Mm -hmm. uh, the you know a toilet for every household, a secondary school education for every child, um, a job for every young person who otherwise might be marching in the streets. Those very very big programs are often quite far removed. Also, rec also it maybe suggests some magical thinking on the part of, of politicians and voters, um, and are quite far removed from what is actually happening. And so there's a big opportunity there, I think, for the research and evaluation community to say, hey, these are great aspirations. Let's help bring the best data and evidence to bear on the series of decisions that are required to make those big dreams real. And so that might be bringing the current body of evidence to bear on program design. Uh, it might be figuring out how to, um, how to expand the reach of new programs in ways that permit learning along the way and an est <clears throat> estimate of what the, the impact is. And you know, I'm, I'm thinking about Johannes's example of the, of the Progressa program. You know, really, as I understand it, it was, it was a big promise, and it was rolled out in a way that permitted the um, rigorous evaluation of impact. So um, 
and there are many, many more um, uh, services, I would say, that external um, uh, uh, organizations can provide to support sound decision making as these large scale programs that have that are result from big political promises are um, designed and rolled out. So I probably haven't um, said this in the most articulate way, but I'm just wondering if we hmm. uh, collectively could think about um, a kind of different way to apply our um, our aspiration for excellent evidence to be used in decision making. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Ruth, and uh, good good food for thought. We're down to our last uh, fifteen minutes, and so uh, here's what we'll have to do: uh, we will um, give uh, Mushfiq and 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 Vidisha your turns. And uh, uh, as you speak, uh, include your whatever final remarks that you might have uh, for, for today. And unfortunately, um, again, three to five minutes, even less if possible. Uh, then I will check to see whether uh, Johannes, uh, Rachel, Ruth have a, a last minute uh, thought, a, a summation kind of thought. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, I'll, I'll try and uh, wrap up. Uh, as efficiently as possible. So with that, uh, Mushfiq, over to you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, can you hear me well, David? Yes. yes. Okay, because some, somebody in the chat was uh, complaining about audio. All right, uh, so there are, I mean, I was actually, while others were talking, I was feverishly typing responses to the many, many excellent questions that have come up um, in the Q&A. And um, yeah, I wanted to move on to COVID work and other examples, but there's just too many questions about this, so let me cover this for a second to answer the questions in, in bulk, and then I'll move on. Um, and I'll try to do this in three, four minutes. Um, so many people were asking about, you know, what happened with this program? Is this practical to think about this particular approach to doing research while scaling? Okay. Um, so I think here are the, here are the lessons that uh, are, uh, that, that I took away from working on these projects and, and other projects. Um, that, that I think might be practically useful. So one is that, you know, it's not just about data and collecting more and more and more data until you've exhausted everything, right? I think the role of theory is extremely important. So we have to understand the theory of change. We have to understand the theory of exactly how, uh, we have to think in advance exactly how, say, other people who are not direct beneficiaries may be affected by the program, right? in rural, you know, what are the markets that they interact with in rural areas. So just as an example, we know people in rural Bangladesh share risk and there's informal insurance, right? And so if you give some people an opportunity to migrate, you know that that might have implications for those risk sharing relationships with others, right? If you know that in advance and we think through the theory, what are the different ways that others might be affected? That tells us exactly where to look. Right. Similarly, we know that these are agricultural laborers, and if the laborers leave, that might change wages for agricultural work, you know, in the pre-harvest period, like for the weeding tasks. Okay. Employers might complain about that because my workers are leaving. If we think through the theory in advance, then we can think about, okay, what type of technology, like a sprayer, might we want to introduce in order to address that? So, so things are very context specific, but I think theory and careful thinking gets you, you know, understanding the theory of change gets you a, a lot of the way there. The second uh, lesson I want to share here is that, no, it's not about like, like putting your, uh, you know, uh, not doing any scaling, not doing any project until you get all these data together, right? I think the lesson we drew from this is that you need to scale in stages. And as you're scaling, so we went from over here, we had a project that only targeted 2000 people. Over here, we had a project that targeted about 30,000 people. Over here, we had a project that targeted about 150,000 households, right? And it made sense to ask the city questions only when we got to 150,000, right? So the idea is that you should be asking the context appropriate and scale appropriate questions at the various stages, you know, not just sit back and wait for all the data, right? So scale in stages, ask the right questions and keep building up evidence, okay? Uh, so we, we continue to, you know, speak the evidence and the practice continue to speak to each other at each stage. Okay? And then there were a whole bunch of questions about external validity, not only to me, but to other 
uh, speakers as well. So let me use an example here. So we started this program in Bangladesh, then we took it to Nepal, we took it to Indonesia. Okay. So here's something simple we learned about external ability. In Indonesia, where people own land, unlike in Bangladesh, where these are mostly landless laborers, right? They don't want to go in the pre-harvest period, even though that's the period where they are deprived and hungry, right? They want to go after the harvest. So the program design actually changed. In Nepal, we when we Seasonal deprivation and hunger is also prevalent, but when we started piloting around the country, we noticed that migration rates were already very high. And if that's true, then I shouldn't be repeating the same program encouraging more migration because people have already figured out how to do that, right? So instead, what we're doing in Nepal is let's provide um, uh, some seasonally timed loans to get people uh, uh, over this uh, the deprivation period, knowing that when their migrant family members return, they'll bring back money and they can repay those loans, okay? So it was about like understanding the theory and the context there and adapting the program, even though the exact same problem still exists, okay? All right, so so finally, I'll just talk a little bit about, um, you know, the social benefit transfer as a targeting in uh, Bangladesh and Nigeria that we're doing, uh, because that's an example of something that had to be scaled up um, countrywide in a matter of weeks, okay? So, so here's the problem that we're facing in the COVID world. There's a whole bunch of new poor people who don't fall under the existing social uh, benefit transfer system, right? social security system. How do we identify them? How do we send money to them? Now, government doesn't have that data. I don't have that data. Nobody does, right? Uh, like directly who is poor or not. But I do have great data from about 15,000 people, like based on other projects I've been running on that allows me to identify who's poor. I've also started doing a lot of um, uh, phone surveys on them. So we also know exactly who's suffering the most. Okay. And now the procedure we're following in Bangladesh is that given that we have the survey data, we've got the ground truth of who's poor, right? We, if we can merge our data with the data from cell phone companies the telecom service providers, right? The reason is that the one piece of data that, uh, or one technology that everybody carries around in the pocket is the cell phone, and therefore the cell phone company has much more data than any of us do, including the government, okay? So now if we were to merge these data, then it turns out it won't surprise listeners to learn that you and I use our cell phones differently than, uh, uh, than the poor do, right? And then when you look at those subtle, you know, differences in the patterns of cell phone usage, so what you can do is, I, you know, by merging the data, you can train a machine learning model in order to pick up those subtle differences in those usage patterns that allows us to indirectly infer who might be poor based on the survey data, right? And once you have that algorithm, you test it, if you feel confident with it, then you can give it back to the cell phone company, then they can run that algorithm to, uh, to the entire to, company. To okay, so, so if this is a case where, okay, what types of data are important? I'll just, I'll just end here. You know, the, the survey data records are important. The cell phone companies, of course, are uh, extremely important. I'll just leave this up there. Um, and then the government regulators are very important that allows, that allows us to do this at scale. So all different actors have to come together. Let me stop there. Great, thank you so much, uh, Mushfiq. Sorry, we don't have time for more. Um, Badisha, over to you. You're on mute, Badisha. Thanks, David. I'll just leave with a couple of uh, parting comments from what I have gathered from, uh, from, from listening to my fellow panelists. Well, I think, uh, and also based on my own experience in the previous work, well, I think uh, what is important is to get a sense of, uh, to successfully scale, it is important to understand the capacity of the scaling organization to actually take the program and implement it um, in a way that it is meant to be implemented with the uh, aim to achieve the outcomes that have been stated in the program documents. So for that, and I agree with Mushfiq previously, as he had said, you know, we need the right data at the right time. And the nature of that, uh, you know, of the data requirement changes according to the stage in which the pro uh, project is, a uh, program is. I want to call for uh, more investments in m and &E system, um, more and sustained investment in m and &E system. We can't be going on collecting survey and survey of data when actually the government systems and even implementing agencies have troves of data which are just un unusable or may not be used effectively. So perhaps working on that system might be um, helpful. Um, introducing scale at the planning stage, irrespective of whether scale happens or not, 
to think about scale at the planning stage is again something that might be useful. Um, and I would just like to say that, you know, I understand that in this current context, uh, you know, resources are, are, are limited and one has to make the best use of resources. So, you know, the idea is to channel it into ones that are more um, effective and hence impact evaluations are ne needed. But um, uh, what is perhaps what also needs to be thought about is, and precisely the question that I could not answer when, I, when the government posed this to me, was what would happen if I were to stop the project or if I were not to scale up? Those also require a, you know, some amount of thought from, uh, from researchers and implementing agencies all over the, all across. Thank you so uh, much, Patricia. So last uh, remarks, uh, uh, Johannes, uh, your, your tweet, your, your, your take in a tweet on, on today. Uh, thanks. So uh, I really appreciate all the comments. Very briefly, my main thought is that, and as a practitioner that I guess I became over my lifetime, um, I think it's very important if you want to convince other practitioners to start thinking seriously about scaling up, you need to keep it simple. And that to me means you need to uh, start with some simple questions that you want these people to think about. Namely, what's the vision that you have? What is the potential pathway? What are the enabling conditions? And what may be the unintended, unintended side effects or consequences, including who could be the losers from your program? Because let's face it, they're always losers and they will be among the political forces trying to oppose what you're trying to do. Or as somebody else said, resources have to be shifted and therefore somebody will lose. Uh, so I think keep it simple, at least to start with, and then bring to bear all the wonderful tools you're developing as researchers to support the practitioner in actually addressing and answering the questions. But first you got to get these people and uh, us all to actually ask the right questions. And I fear, as also some of the surveys showed just now, frankly, we're not yet at that stage where enough people ask the right questions. Thank you, David. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, Rachel? Last. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, I guess my last point would be um, response to someone in the Q&A who had said, what's wrong with small? And um, I do think there's a valid point there that we mustn't confuse scale with uniformity. And um, I guess going back to COVID, we've seen a lot of very, very effective community-led approaches to managing lockdown. And um, Mm. Uh, and targeting resources. So I guess my last piece would be um, just to be really careful that scale doesn't rule out local. Mm -hmm. Over. Great, thank you, Rachel. Uh, Ruth. You know, I have been listening so hard to other people and learning so much that I don't have a new idea to offer. Uh, I do think that the there are many issues that have been raised here about how uh, both funders and external um, uh, people providing external kind of analytic uh, support uh, can do a better and more responsible job, particularly when they're uh, working in service of uh, um, kind of government action. So I'm more taking away some uh, deep thinking from my other panelists and from those who offered comments and questions uh, than I am uh, giving any summary remarks. So thanks very much for this opportunity. Great. And we have one more poll question in the last two minutes here. Uh, could we show it? Uh, Five years from now, will more and better attention be paid to scaling issues in the design and implementation of impact evaluations? Um, so pick your where you are on that spectrum. Especially Just, after this panel. Yes, exactly. Have we been have we been persuasive or not? And uh, <laughs> or have we destroyed your confidence? And uh, while you're uh, voting, let me just say that uh, I'm not going to try to summarize uh, everything, but there is a blog that will be up uh, within 24 hours. It's being written right now, I think, uh, that's capturing what we said. And we'll, everyone will have a chance to react to that blog and said yes or no, it did a good or a not good job. 
of summarizing. And here are the, here are the findings. Well, panelists, uh, you get a, a, a gold star because there's a, a pretty good uh, optimism here. You've changed the world in the, in the past of the uh, uh, last 90 uh, seconds. And uh, thanks to the audience. I am going to um, uh, mention uh, uh, something about the whole series since we're at the end of the last series. What have the themes been coming out of the series for those who've been sticking through all five or, uh, or read about them? And I would mention these. Uh, it, there's a sense uh, coming through loud and clear that good evidence from good impact evaluation and good uptake and use is important, more important now than ever as we head into this new world in the wake of uh, the COVID pandemic. And there will be new challenges, but also new opportunities. Uh, we all need to think about and act upon uh, all of that as we learn more. And we have a long way to go. We cannot pat ourselves in the back, but we also should not give up. Second, the generators and users of good evidence have a lot more to do and to help and, uh, and understand uh, from each other what decision makers uh, need in order to have easy access to timely, reliable, implementable information so that wise choices can be made. Uh, this is a theme that I think across all five has come through. Uh, and finally, the cost dimension needs to be a particular priority. That wasn't prominent in this conversation, but it has been in previous ones, so that we not only look at the benefit side, but also costs and, and, uh, and scaling is, is obviously uh, critical. I'd like to close by thanking all of our uh, panelists and to the audience. Uh, we miss you. We miss seeing you and hearing you, but your questions were terrific, and I hope we did as decent a job as we could uh, in um, responding to them. And uh, there's much more that could follow up on this conversation, and I hope there will be. Uh, while this is the last event in this series, we will be holding more events like this in the months and the years ahead. So do watch for announcements and, uh, and we hope to have more interactions with many of you at these events. Thank you again to the uh, literally hundreds who stuck with us through the end. And uh, we're um, uh, unfortunately gonna have to end it there. So thanks everyone and uh, uh, stay safe. <laughs>